How do human beings constitute themselves as subjects? It is in these terms that Michel Foucault recently defined his work of the last 20 years. Indeed, the constitution of subjectivity undoubtedly provides the perspective from which the more familiar Foucauldian concerns with power and with the history of sexuality can best be understood. For if the fundamental exercise of power over individuals is their own confessional interpretation of themselves, then a study of networks of power inevitably leads to a dismantling analysis of the technologies of the self, to what Michel Foucault has called a genealogy of the subject in Western society. This extraordinary enterprise has led to crucial reevaluations on the part of Michel Foucault of political freedom and resistance. If we are acted upon most effectively by power relations internal to our own sense of ourselves, then the resistance to power must perhaps take the form, ultimately, of an unprecedented, non-ascetic, perhaps anarchic form of self-repudiation. Michel Foucault's study of the culture of self is therefore inseparable from the prospect of promoting new forms of subjectivity. And it is as part of this ambitious and exhilarating project, a project of militant scholarship, that Michel Foucault, currently Regents Lecturer in the French Department, will speak to us this evening and will, tomorrow, answer questions in English – there will be no questions tonight – in an open discussion meeting which you are invited to attend at 4 p.m. tomorrow in Moffitt 102. I would first like to thank the Regents Lecture Committee and the Department of French, and of course my friend Leo Berset. And I would like to tell my friends in Berkeley how glad I feel to be back among them. In a dialogue written at the end of the second century after death, Lucien presents us a certain Hermotimus, who walks mumbling in the street. One of his friends, Licinus, sees him, crosses the street, and asks him, what are you mumbling about? And the answer comes, I am trying to remember what I have to tell to my master. And through the conversation between those two, Hermotimus and Licinus, we learn that Hermotimus has been visiting his master for 20 years, that he is nearly ruined by the very high cost of those precious lessons, and we learned that uh, Hermotimus may need 20 years more to arrive at the, head, at the end of his training, but we learn also what those lessons are about. Hermotimus is taught by his master how to take care of himself in the best possible way. <laughs> I am sure that none of you is a modern Hermotimus, but I hold the bet that most of you have met at least one of those guys who nowadays regularly visit a kind of master who takes their money from them in order to teach them how to take care of themselves. <laughs> but for, fortunately enough, I have forgotten either in French or in English or in German the name of those modern masters in antiquity, they were called philosophers. <laughs> in order to explain why I am interested in the theme of the culture of the self as a philosophical 
and as an historical question, I'd like to take as a point of departure a short text written by Kant in 1784. The text is Was ist Aufklärung? Enlightenment. Uh, Enlightenment. This text was an answer to a question pu published by the Berlinische Monatschrift, and at this, this same question, Moses Mendelssohn gave also his own answer, which was published two months before Kant's answer. I think that a certain answer. I think that a certain attention has to be paid to this text. First, it is worthwhile to underline that the German philosophical movement through Kant and the Jewish Ascala through Moses Mendelssohn met at the same moment on the same topics, was ist Aufklärung. It is also worthwhile to pay attention to this kind of philosophical interrogation about the present. Of course, I know that it is not the first time philosophers ask questions about their own present, about the historical or religious or philosophical meaning of the present. But most of the time, those interrogations deal either with a comparison between the present moment and a previous one, or uh, uh, those interrogations deal with the announcement of a future through uh, some signs which have to be deciphered. Most of the time, the question about present is a question about decline or improvement, proximity of a new age, or arrival of the promised last days. In Kant's text, the question is put in terms of a very specific achievement in the general history of reason, or more precisely, in the general history of the way we use our reason. And this kind of interrogation is interesting on two grounds. First, the first reason is that the 18th century is very often credited with the universal conception of reason, and this assumption is correct. But the 18th century has been also aware of the historical changes in the use of reason. And the representation Kant gives of those historical changes is very different from a simple progress of development of reason. But I think that there is another justification for paying attention to the uh, text written by Kant about enlightenment. This text, I think, has introduced in the field of philosophical reflection, a new kind of question, the question of the nature, the meaning, the historical and philosophical signification of the which he is himself a part. I don't mean that previous philosophers did not, were not aware of their own present and that they did not worry about it. Hobbes, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz took into account their own situation and the situation of the contemporary world, as Plato did or Augustine. But for Descartes, the failure of several so-called sciences, for Hobbes, the political situation of England, for Leibniz, the religious debates and quarrels, were reasons for them to intervene and try to change something in such a situation. I think that Kant's question about Aufklärung meant something else. At the same time, Kant gives a justification of his own philosophical task through analyzing the actuality which he belonged to, and he gives as a target to his philosophical work to play a certain role in the natural, in the spontaneous history of reason. In this short paper, 
about enlightenment, Kant raises a set of questions which I think are characteristic for modern philosophy. And those questions are, what is our actuality as an historical figure? What are we and what do we have to be as part of this actuality? Why is it necessary to philosophize and why is it the specific and what is the specific task of philosophy in relation to this actuality? I think that those questions did not remain embedded, buried in this rather obscure text, but uh, that they took more and more importance in Western philosophy. When Fichte was concerned with this rather extraordinary event, it was not only that he felt he should be a support of me, but was the role of his own philosophy in this event. In a certain way, Hegel's philosophy is an attempt to answer this very simple question, what is the meaning of this day when so much as a result of the critic itself, but as a result of this critical historical question, what are we now? I think that we can find in the field of philosophical activities since the beginning of the 19th century, two poles which are related to each, to each other and which cannot be reduced to each other. At one of these poles, you find such questions as what is truth? How is it possible to know the truth? That is the pole of philosophy as formal ontology of truth or as critical analysis of knowledge. And at the other pole, you find such questions as what is our actuality? What are we as part of this actuality? What is the target of our activity of philosophizing insofar as we are part of our actuality? Those questions deal with what I should call the historical ontology of ourselves or the critical history of thought. It is uh, in the framework of this second type of questions that I have undertook several historical inquiries about madness or medicine, crime and punishment or about sexuality. Of course, there have been several ways and there are still several ways for elaborating those questions about our historical ontology. But I think that any ontological history of ourselves have to analyze three sets of relations. Our relations to truth, our relations to obligation, our relations to ourselves and to the others. Or to turn it with other words, in order to answer the question, what are we now? We have to consider that we are thinking beings since it is through thought that we are beings who look for truth, who accept or refuse obligation, obligations, laws, coercitions, and who are related to ourselves or to the others. My aim is not to answer the general question, what is a thinking being? My aim is to answer the question, how did the history of our thought, I mean of our relation to truth, to obligations, to ourselves and to the others, make us what we are? In brief, how could we analyze the formation of ourselves through the history of our thought? And by thought, I do not mean exclusively philosophy, nor theoretical thinking, nor scientific knowledge. I don't want to analyze what people think opposed to what they do, 
but what they think, what they do when they are well, and, and uh, what they think when they do what they are doing. What I want to analyze is the meaning they give to their own behavior, the way they integrate their behavior in general strategies, the type of rationality they recognize in their different practices, institutions, models, and behavior. When I was studying madness and psychiatry, crime and punishment, I have been led to emphasize the analysis of our relation first to truth and then to obligation. Studying now the constitution of our experience of sexuality, I have been more and more inclined to pay attention to the relation to oneself and to the techniques through which those relations have been shaped. In order to analyze these techniques of the self, I'd like to choose as a point of departure a notion which has been, I think, very important in the Greek and in the Roman culture. I'll try tonight to give you a very short draft of the problems linked to this notion, and maybe we could elaborate uh, this first resume uh, during the meetings and seminars we'll have together during the next weeks. This notion, which I have cho chosen as a point of departure, is what the Greeks called epimeleia heotu, and the Latins cura sui. It's not very easy to translate th these terms, but I'll try. Epimeleia heotu is something like the concern with oneself, or, as we say in French, le souci de soi. The verbal form, epimeleistai heotu, means something like to be concerned with oneself, to take care of oneself, s'occuper de soi-même. The precept that one has to take care of oneself, to be concerned with oneself, precept that one has to epimeleistai heotu, was for the Greeks and the Romans one of the main principles of ethics, one of the main rules for their art of life. And this for almost uh, a thousand years. Let's have a look at some marking points in this very long period. First, Socrates himself. In the Apology written by Plato, we see Socrates presenting himself before his judges as the master of the concern with oneself. He addresses passers-by and tells them, you concern yourselves with your riches, with your reputation, with your honors, but you do not concern yourself with your virtue or with your soul. And Socrates watches over his fellow citizens to make sure that they take care of themselves. He considers that this task has been confirmed, conferred on him by the God and he will not abandon it except with his last breath. Well, eight centuries later, the same notion of uh, concern with oneself, epimeleia heotu, the same notion appears with a role equally very important in a Christian author, Gregory of Nyssa. But it has in Gregory of Nyssa a very different meaning. By this term, Gregory of Nyssa means the movement by which one renounces marriage, detaches oneself from the flesh, and by which, thanks to a virginity of heart and body, one recovers the immortality of which one has, be, has been deprived. In another passage of the same Treatise of Virginity, Gregory makes of the parable of the, lo of the lost drachma the model of concern with oneself. For a lost drachma, 
you must light a lamp, turn the whole house over, search in every corner, until, gleaming in the shadows, you see the coin's metal. In the same way, in order to recover the effigy which God has printed in our soul and which the body has tarnished, one must take care of oneself, light the lamp of reason, and search every corner of the soul. Between those two extreme points of reference, Socrates and Gregory of Nyssa, one can state that the concern with oneself constituted not only a constant principle, but a very large practice. Amongst those philosophers who claim to be advisors on life and guides on existence, the principle of occupying oneself with oneself was almost universally accepted. Following their master, the Epicureans repeat that it is never too early and never too late to occupy oneself with one's soul. Musonius Rufus, from amongst the Stoics, says also, it is in constantly paying attention to oneself that one assures one's salvation. Or Seneca, you must attend to your soul, attend to yourself, lose no time doing so. Retire into yourself and stay there. Dio of Prusa gives one lecture over to the necessity of an eis eoton anachoresis, a retreat into oneself. And Galen, recalling how much time it is, necess is necessary to train a doctor, an orator, or a grammatician, thinks that even more time is necessary to become a good man. Years and years, he says, spent in occupying yourself with yourself. Epictetus, in one of his Diatribae, uh, gives this definition of human being. Man is this unique kind of beings on the earth who have to take care of themselves. Nature has provided animals with everything they need, Humans don't have the same natural equipment, but we must understand that the necessity of taking care of ourselves is also a supplementary gift which has been bestowed. God has confided us to ourselves, giving us by this means the possibility and the duty of being free. For Epictetus, the Epimeleia Heotu which is ontologically linked to human finitude, is the practical form of freedom. And it is by taking care of himself that human being becomes similar to God, God who has nothing else to do than taking care of himself. <laughs> For us now, the notion of epimeleia heotu is faded and obscure. It seems to have been covered over either by the Socratic precept, gnoti se oton, or by the Christian principles of asceticism, which implies renouncing to oneself, to that extent that if we are asked what was the most important moral principle and the most characteristic in ancient philosophy, the answer which comes immediately to mind is not epimele seuto, take care of yourself, but, as you know, gnothi seuton, know yourself. Perhaps our philosophical and historical tradition has somehow overrated the importance of the gnothi seuton, of the know yourself. One must remember that the rule of having to know oneself, was in fact, and in the ancient culture, constantly associated with that of concerning oneself with oneself. And more than that, to know oneself was considered as a means 
for taking care of oneself. And when we consider Christian asceticism, we are used to underscore the rule of renouncing oneself. And we forget that in the spiritual experience of some early Christians like Gregory of Nyssa. Renouncing oneself was a way of taking care of oneself, or at least a new form of the old philosophical epimeleia eutu. And I think that we have to be uh, aware that those two great figures of the Western experience of the self, the self-knowledge and asceticism, those two great figures are rooted in this multi-secular tradition of the care of the self, the care of the self being at the same time in the Greco-Roman culture a notion, a precept, an attitude and a technique, a, practic a practical matrix for the experience of the self. Most of the historians of ancient philosophy are concerned with the rays of ontology and metaphysics from Parmenides to Aristoteles through Plato. Most of the historians of Greek sciences are interested in the rays of rational thought through mathematics and cosmology. I think it could be valuable to study also the rays of a certain type of subjectivity of a certain type of relation to oneself in this Greco-Latin culture of the self. Greek metaphysics has been determinant for our philosophical relationship to being. Greek science has been determinant for our rational relationship to the world. The Greco-Roman culture of the self has been, I think, determinant for our ethical relationship to ourselves. And my dream would be, if I could find people interested in the same topics, to start an historical analysis of those techniques of the self in the Western societies from the beginning of the Greek uh, civilization. My intention tonight is to present you a very brief survey of some aspects of this culture of the self in the uh, Greek and in the Greco-Roman civilization. Uh, uh, and I'll take only two, view, two views on this culture of the self, one in the, uh, fifth, in the fourth century before Christ and the other on the two first centuries uh, of our era. It has been sometimes said that uh, 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 the culture of the self in the Greco-Roman society was linked to the decay of the old political and social structures, the, declines, the decline of the cities, the decline of the old and traditional aristocracies, the development of autocratic regimes, the increasing, increasing importance of private life could have been factors for the raise of a so-called individualism. But my hypothesis is that those historical processes, if they really took place, may have produced some changes in the culture of the self, but they are not by themselves the reason for the high value attributed to the care of the self. And this care of the, the self is very well known and very highly, highly valued since uh, at least the fourth century uh, before Christ. For instance, following at least uh, Plutarch, a king of Sparta, when he was asked by someone why Spartans did not cultivate uh, uh, their land by themselves, but let the islots do the job for them. This king of Sparta gave this answer. The reason why we do not cultivate our land is that we prefer to take care of ourselves. <laughs> and in Xenophon, in the Cyropedia, we see Cyrus, a model of a great king, 
and a good man following Xenophon, we see Cyrus coming back in his palace after several great victories and conquests, and he uh, uh, meets his old friends and companions and asks them, well, what shall we do now? And Cyrus himself gives the answer. Uh, the, uh, the answer is not, well, I'll take care or will take care of the new empire, he says, and now that we have won victory, we have to take care of ourselves. The culture of the self is not a late phenomenon due to the decline of the classical city. It was an early phenomenon and it took in the antiquity several forms. The first philosophical elaboration of the principle you must concern with your, yourself with yourself is found in a dialogue written by Plato in the Alcibiades. Uh, the uh, Neoplatonists considered that this dialogue had to be the first in the collection of Plato's works. Albinus, a Neoplatonist of the second century after death, said that every naturally gifted young man who has reached the age of philosophizing and practicing virtue, should begin by studying the Alcibiades. And Procus considered this dialogue as the Arche Apaces Philosophias, means the principle and point of departure for all philosophy, because this dialogue teaches people to get concerned with themselves. And in, fact, and in spite of the late subtitle given to the text Peri uh, uh, Anthropines Fuseos about uh, human nature, the theme, the topics of the entire dialogue is the Epimeleia Heotu. Socrates tries to convince Alcibiades that he has to take care of himself. And I'd like to underline only three or four points in, in this uh, uh, analysis of the Epimeleia Eotu. The first is why should Alcibiades take care of himself? The, re the reason given by Socrates is that he is at a point of transition in his life. Uh, uh, Alcibiades is not satisfied with the privileges given to him by his birth, his fortune, his status. He says specifically that he does not want to spend his life, katabionai, profiting from all this. Alcibiades wishes to gain the advantage over all the others inside the city and outside also over the kings of Sparta and over Persian sovereign. But Alcibiades very soon shows that he is unable to succeed in his attempt. He did not receive the good education the young Spartan, Spartans enjoy. He has been given over to an old slave completely ignorant, and he does not even know what the words justice and concord mean. Discovering how ignorant he is, Alcibiades is in the greatest embarrassment. He despairs, but Socrates intervenes and tells him this important thing. If you were 50 years old, the situation would be serious. Then it would be too late. But you are still very young, and it is precisely the moment when you have to to take care of yourself. So, as you see, the, uh, uh, the obligation of taking care of oneself is directly linked first to the age of the youth, to his project of uh, ruling the city, and to a defective pedagogy. But how can Alcibiades take care of himself? Nobody is ready to help him 
at least among the crowd of, the, of followers, he, uh, the crowd of followers he had when he was still very young. Now, when the dialogue starts, uh, uh, Alcibiades is over 16 or 17. He has grown up. He has beard on his cheeks. He is not desirable anymore. That is precisely the reason why Socrates intervenes. Socrates has for Alcibiades a philosophical love and is able to help him in taking care of himself. So, as you see, the care of the self is directly linked to a kind of personal relation, a personal and philosophical love from the uh, master uh, towards the disciple. But Socrates and Alcibiades have to make clear what is precisely the concern with oneself, what this concern with oneself consists in. And Socrates explains that the self is nothing else than soul. And that taking care of the soul implies that one discovers what this soul really is. And therefore, one has to contemplate his own soul, or better than that, the divine element, which is the reality of the soul. Briefly, we can see that in the Alcibiades, the care of the self is clearly linked to the political ambition of a young aristocrat. If you want to rule the others, you have first to concern with yourself. Secondly, the concern of the, with the self is linked to a defective pedagogy. You have to take care of yourself since the education has been unable to teach you what you need to know. Third, it is linked with an erotic and philosophical relation between the youth and the teacher. And it has the main form of the self-contemplation of soul. Well, I think that the uh, culture of the self that appears in the Greco-Roman culture of the two first centuries of our era is deeply different from what we have met with Alcibiades, Socrates, and Plato. Compared to the Socratic Epimeleiates Psyches, the culture of the self, which is practiced by Seneca, Dio of Prusa, Epictetus, Plutarch, Marcus Aurelius, Galen, and so on, seems different on the very point I have just mentioned. And thus, it can be considered as an important step towards what will be seen as the Christian technology of the self. This new or partly new culture of the self, which we can observe in the uh, Greco-Roman culture of the two first centuries of our era. This new culture of the self implies, first, a permanent relationship to oneself, and not only a preparation in order to become a good ruler of the city. It implies a critical relationship to the self and not only a complement to a defective pedagogy. For, uh, uh, three, it implies an author authoritarian relationship to the master and not an erotic relation. And four, it implies a set of practices, of ascetical practices, very different from the pure contemplation of the soul. I think that those four ideas of a permanent relationship to oneself, a critical relationship to oneself, an authoritarian relationship to another in order to take care of oneself, 
and the, this, uh, this idea that the care of the self is not only a pure contemplation but a set of practices or that is characteristic not only of the culture of the self in the first centuries of our era but also of the Christian care of the self and in a certain way of uh, our own culture of the self. First point, the care of the self has to be a permanent relationship to oneself. Socrates, you will remember, recommended to Alcibiades to profit from his youth and occupy himself with himself. At 50, it would be too late. Well, Epicurus, on the contrary, and Epicurus wrote very, uh, rather soon after Socrates in the third century, Epicurus said, when you are young, you must not hesitate in philosophizing. And when you are old, you must not hesitate in philosophizing. It is never too early and it is never too late to concern yourself with your soul. It is this principle of perpetual attention to oneself throughout one's life which very clearly gains the upper hand. Musonius Rufus, for example, says, you must take care of yourself without ceasing if you are to lead a life conducive to well-being. And Galen, in order to become an accomplished man, each one needs, so to speak, to exert himself all his life even if it is true that it would be much better to have kept watch over one's soul since one's earliest age. It is a fact that the friends to whom Seneca or Plutarch give advices are not any longer those ambitious and desirable young men whom Socrates addressed himself to. They are men sometimes young, like Serenus, sometimes fully mature, like Lucilius, who had the very important position of procurator in Sicily when Seneca and him exchanged a long spiritual correspondence. Epictetus keeps a school for young people, that's, that's true, but sometimes he has occasion to speak with adults or even with consular figures to remind, them that their task of, uh, to remind them of their task of occupying themselves with themselves. And Marcus Aurelius brings together his notes, his, uh, and when he does that, he is exercising the function of emperor, and for him it is a question of coming to his own aid. Being occupied with oneself is not therefore a simple momentary preparation for life. It is a life form. Alcibiades re realized that he, would, that he should occupy himself with himself insofar as he wanted consequently to occupy himself with others. Now it is a question of occupying yourself with yourself and for yourself. It is from this fact that comes the very important idea of changing one's attitude towards oneself, ad se convertere, the idea of a movement in one's existence by which one turns back on oneself as an ultimate target. You will tell me that the epistrophe, this conversion, is a typically platonic theme, but as we have seen with the Alcibiades, the movement by which the soul turns towards itself is also a movement by which its gaze is attracted towards light, towards reality, towards the uh, divine element, towards the essence and the super celestial world where uh, the, uh, the essences are visible. The turning back to which one is invited by Seneca, Plutarch, or Epictetus. This turning back is quite different. It is a kind of turning round on the spot. It has no other end or conclusion than taking up residence in oneself and staying there. 
The final objective of conversion to oneself is the, establishment, the, the, is the establishment of a certain numbers of relation with oneself. Sometimes these relations are conceived of according to a juridico political model. The target is becoming a sovereign over oneself, exercising complete mastery over oneself, being fully independent, being completely one's own, fieri sum, as Seneca often says. They are also often represented according to the model of enjoyment of possessions, to enjoy oneself, take pleasure in oneself, find the satisfaction of one's desire in oneself. Uh, in this form of thought, in this form of culture of the self, the relation to oneself, to oneself is orientated by a kind of internal finality. A second big difference is concerned with pedagogy. In the Alcibiades, the uh, concern with oneself was necessary because of faults in pedagogy, complementing teaching and substituting itself for it, a question in case of offering a training. For the moment, when concern with oneself has become an adult practice, which one must undertake uh, all along one's life, its pedagogical role tends to be a fast and other functions present themselves. Firstly, a critical function. The cultivation of the self should permit one not only to uh, uh, acquire new knowledge, but better than that, to get rid of all bad habits, all false opinion derived from the crowd, from the, bast, from the bad masters, and also from relatives and entourage, to unlearn, dédisquerer, is one of the important tasks of the development of oneself. But it has also the function of a struggle. The practice of oneself is conceived now as a permanent fight. It is not simply a question of training a man of value for the future. One must give to the individual the arms and the courage which will permit him to fight all his life. You are aware, no doubt, of the frequency of those two metaphors, that of the athletic contest. In life, one is like a wrestler who must free himself from successive adversaries and who must keep in training even when he is not in combat. And the metaphor of war, uh, life must be or, uh, the self must be organized like an army which may at any moment be assailed by the enemy. The great Christian theme of spiritual combat of the soul, the spiritual struggle of the soul, is already a fundamental principle of the cultivation of the self in those ancient pagan times. But of, above all, this cultivation of the self has a curative and therapeutic function. It is much nearer to the medical model than to the pedagogical one. One must, of course, remember some extremely ancient facts about Greek culture the existence of a notion such as that of pathos, which signifies the passion of the soul as well as an illness of the body. The breadth of a meta metaphorical field which permits the application to the body and the soul of expressions such as cure, look after, amputate, scarify, purge, and so on. One must remember also the principle familiar to the Epicureans, the Cynics, and the Stoics. That's the role of philosophy, is to heal the maladies of the soul. Plutarch could say one day that philosophy and medicine constitute mia cora, a single area, a single feed. But I would also wish to insist on the practical correlation between 
medicine and the cultivation of the self. Epictetus did not want his school to be considered simply as a school or as a training place. Rather, he wanted his school to be considered as a doctor's consulting room, what he called a yatreion. He wanted it to be a dispensary for the soul, and he wanted his pupils to take conscious of the fact that they were ill. One of them, he said, has a shoulder out of joint, the second one has an abscess, the third a fistula, another a headache, and all of them wish to learn syllogism. The, the first cure they, they need is a medical cure. They have to cure their wounds. They have to f stop the flow of their humor. They have to calm their spirits. Inversely, a doctor such as Galen considers it to be within his competence to heal the soul from the passions that is to say, from disordered energies, rebels to reason, but also the errors which are born of false opinions. In the treatise on the patience of the soul, Galen quotes cures he had undertaken and been su successful in. He has cured one of his companions inclined to anger. He has helped a young man soul, whose soul was troubled by events of little importance. All those ideas may appear now very familiar. Uh, in fact, they are so. But I think it is very important for the history of subjectivity in the West to catch the first links between the experience of the self and the medical practice. It is important to catch at which moment and under which conditions those relations between the medical practice and the experience, the inner experience of oneself has been related one to the other. Uh, and now I would like to evoke the third point I spoke about, uh, uh, I should like to indicate rapidly the third great difference between the occupation with oneself in the Alcibiades and the practice of the self in the culture of the imperial period. As you remember, in Plato's dialogue, the erotico-philosophical relationship with the master was something essential. It's, it constituted the framework within which Socrates and Alcibiades together took in hand the soul of the young man. In the first and in the second centuries of uh, um, our era, the relation to the self has become considered always as relying on the relationship with the master, a director, or in any case to someone else, but more and more independent of the uh, amorous relationship. It is very generally admitted that one cannot occupy oneself with oneself without the help of another. Seneca said that nobody is sufficiently strong to free himself from the state of stultitia in which he is. But those necessary relationships between uh, a discipline and a master are a kind of uh, technical or sometimes administrative institutional relation and nothing to do with the erotic relation. There are uh, some strictly scholastic organization. For instance, the school of Epictetus can serve as an example. Uh, it, there are uh, in, uh, in this school a set of hierarchic relations and a set of different trainings. There are a passing audience uh, with, uh, where the pupils are received for longer courses. But there are also lessons who are given to uh, passers-by or people who uh, want only to have a short consultation. Certain of the discourses uh, reassembled by Arian are technical lessons for those future practitioners of cultivation of the self. 
One finds also, above all in Rome, some private councillors installed in the entourage of some great personage, part of their group or of their clientele. Nothing to do, as you see, to, with the erotic relation. And the last point. Uh, we must not imagine that this culture of the self was only a piece of abstract advice given by a few philosophers and technicians of the soul to a handful of disciples. We must not imagine that this concern with oneself was only a moral attitude. It was a widespread activity with a set of um, multivarious activities, techniques and devices. Unfortunately, I have no time to spread on this issue. I would like only to uh, underline as an example the importance of writing in the culture of the self. It is often assumed that personal writing is a modern discovery, maybe an innovation of the 16th century or the Reformation. In fact, the relation to oneself to, through writing has been a very long tradition of the West. And I think that it is possible to observe a shift from the culture of memory, which is still dominant in the Socratic attitude, towards the practice of writing and taking notes in the culture of the uh, Greco-Roman period. The culture of the self in this period. The culture of the self implied the use of personal note books, what they called hypomnemata. And in those personal note books, you had to note your readings, your conversations, the, the, the themes for future meditation. You had also to uh, write your dreams. You had uh, to write your daily schedule. Writing letters was also something important among those practices of the self because in a letter you have uh, at the same time to entertain a relation to yourself and a relation to somebody else who can be a director or a friend, friend or, or somebody to whom you give advices which are valuable both for him and for you. At the same time, as these practices spread, it would seem that the experience of oneself was, by virtue of this very fact, intensified and widened. The self becomes a field of observations. The, le the letters of Seneca and Pliny, the correspondence between Marcus Aurelius and Fronto shows this vigilance and the meticulousness with regard to the attention which one should pay to oneself. It often concerns the details of daily life, nuances of health and mood, the small physical malaise that one experiences, the movements of spirits, one's readings, quotations that one remembers, reflections on such, and such an event, a certain way of relating to oneself and a world field of experience are to be seen where in earlier documents they are absent. And from this point of view, the sacred discourses of Elius Aristides constitute a remarkable witness. These texts written by uh, Elius Aristides are expressions of gratitude towards Asclepius, the god of health. Elius Aristides, in fact, had been sick during uh, more than 10 years. But what is interesting is that in this text, which is an expression of gratitude to the god who uh, uh, saved uh, Elius Aristides, Elius Aristides gives the uh, transcription of hundred and hundred of dreams that he had during those 10 years. And this text 
uh, which uh, in these originally formed had uh, more than 300,000 uh, of lines, uh, this text is a real personal journal of uh, not only the, the illness of Ilius Aristides, but of his every day and every night life. In the traditional framework of a gratitude to the to God, uh, Elius Aristides unfolds an account uh, of his illness, malaises, sufferings, diverse feelings, his premonitory dream, and the dreams which offer advices, me medicines which had to be tried out, and so on. Are the limits of the hypochondrial uh, symptom reaches in this case? It's certain. But the problem is not to know to what point Elius Aristides was ill. Rather, what is important is to uh, recognize the means which the culture of his time gave him in order to formulate his personal experience of illness and to transmit it to the others. Uh, forgive me for passing over so quickly. I wanted to suggest that the theme of concerning oneself with oneself at this period, that of the high empire, is not to be uh, found within uh, any one particular, particular philosophical doctrine. It is a universal precept and it is also a real practice. Many individuals res respond to its call. It is a practice which has its institutions, its rule, its methods, its, its techniques, its exercise, and it is also a mode of experience, of individual experience, an individual experience, but also a collective experience with its means and its form of expression. And that's the reason why I think we can speak of the culture of the self at this moment. As a conclusion, I think that we have to answer a, a, a legitimate question. If it is true, as I have just said, that the concern with oneself and all the techniques which have been tied up with it at such importance in the classical culture, how is it that this theme has apparently disappeared or seems to have disappeared? How is it to express things very simply, that one has presented the uh, memory of Gnoti Seoton as one of the highest expression of the ancient thought, whilst one has forgotten the importance which was for a long time given to the other principle, Epimele Seoto, take care of yourself. It seems to me that one can give several reasons for that. First is the ethical paradox of Christian asceticism. In this kind of asceticism, the concern for the self has to take the form of a sacrifice. The renouncement to the self is the major, the major target of the work we have to do on ourselves. The second reason is that most of those techniques of the self have been integrated in our world in educational and pedagogical, in medical and psychological techniques. The techniques of the self have been embedded either in some authoritarian and disciplinary structure or substituted for and transformed by public opinion, mass media, polling, te polling techniques, which play a formative role in our attitude towards the others and towards ourselves, so that the culture of the self is now imposed on people by the other, and the culture of the self has lost its uh, independence. The third reason is, I think, that human sciences, Suppose that the main, the major relationship to the self is and has to be essentially a relationship of knowledge. And the fourth reason, and the last one, is that most of the time, 
people think that what we have to do is to disclose, to liberate, to excavate the hidden reality of the self. But the self, I think, has to be considered not as a reality uh, uh, which can be hidden. Uh, I think that the self has to be considered as the correlate of technologies built and developed through our history. The problem then is not to liberate, is not to free the self, but to consider how the self could, uh, but to consider how it could be possible to elaborate new types, new kinds of relationship to ourselves. Thank you.